Welcome in from your SUV, from your tractor or your ute, or maybe you're even riding your electric motorbike. But from wherever you are, you're with Alistair Moorhead and Glenn Judson, and this is The Alan Juddy Show. Well, what we want to do is reach out and provide you some technical information on a range of agricultural topics which may interest you. But to do it in a different way. Casual and comfortable format that allows you to listen where you want and when you want. This is intended for general information, and for more specific advice, contact your local Agricom rep. Well, I'm excited, Alistair, about this uh, next segment. We've got Lara from Marketing. Hey, Lara. Hey, guys. <laughs> so Lara's going to ask us some questions that have been sent in off our Facebook page. So um, uh, let's see if we can answer those. Right. In your opinion, what works better, plantain, chicory, or brassicas? Well, how about Alistair? Who, you, who asked that question? Like? Justin. Justin flicked that through. Okay, Justin. Right. Um, Alistair, how about you talk to Justin about that from an agronomic point of view, and I'll make some comments from an animal point of view. Right, because we don't know the animals. That's the one weakness of the question, Justin, is that uh, don't quite know exactly uh, what stock classes we're discussing, but I'm assuming you're looking at summer cropping. And uh, I personally always see uh, summer brassica as one of the most consistent upfront uh, volumes of feed you can get from a dry environment. So the drier your location, the more summer brassica, particularly a rape crop, uh, is your uh, feed in the bank, uh, feed that you can use spring based moisture and carry it into summer as a large volume of guaranteed feed, even if it's drying down. Uh, both the, pl the plantain uh, is a summer crop, but technically I wouldn't use it as a summer crop unless you're in a, a, a summer moist environment where I'd use plantain and, and clover. And then it's actually the clover that's driving that summer growth, uh, not just the plantain. But the chicory is without doubt my other major cropping favourite in summertime. And the reason is that you never get as much as a brassica up front, but it finishes so much stronger. So the longer your dry phase lasts, the more chicory is a suitable species because every regrowth cycle on a brassica is slowly declining, whereas chicory is just getting better and better on regrowth cycles. And typically you're actually dealing with a lot of dry matter quite late in late summer and, and even mid-autumn with chicory before it declines. So that's the species fit. Yeah, from an animal perspective, again, we don't know what animals. Um, we're assuming it's not chooks. Uh, so if you were if you were thinking about uh, finishing, um, I, I agree with Alistair that probably the go to is the the um, the summer brassica. Just watch in terms of um, getting animals onto that, and I think the feed budget in terms of getting the right amount in is quite critical because um, you can't do much else with that. You've got to graze it. Um, I think in those dry land areas, I do like the chicory um, in terms of being able to punch uh, further into that uh, dry. Um, I'm not convinced about it as a lactation feed. Um, we need there's need to be some more work on that. But certainly what, for what sort of lactation feed, Glenn? Sorry? What sort of lactation feed? I'm I'm talking about in that early phase um, in the spring. In the spring. Okay, um, we're talking about summer crop here, though. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, thing. Yeah, we'll answer just, the question. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, answer I'm, the question, Glenn. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but, but in terms of holding up through those dry periods, absolutely. Um, having said that, uh, chicory in its second year, throwing up a seed head, can be problematic from a, um, a quality point of view. Um, uh, plantain, let's call it ecotain, um, I think is a very useful um, early season. And the other thing, um, particularly with ecotain, is it can help you meet some of those environmental regulations if we're reducing nitrate from the urine patch. So actually, um, all of them have their place. Um, it just depends on what you're, yeah, um, yes. what you're afterwards. And, and actually, chooks will eat them. Um, all, but, all, all three of them. Yeah. If so, not, if not the plants, the slugs that may come on them. Excellent. <laughs> so thanks for the question, Justin. Great. Um, Shelley has asked, will Juddy ever send my book back? I'm going to answer that for you, Shelley. This is Alistair speaking. Al, uh, I can say for a fact, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, what he said. So Shelley, it looks like you won't be getting your book back. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for listening. If you guys want to send in your questions, um, hit us up on email at info at agricom.co.nz or on our Facebook page, Agricom NZ. Anything serious and everything in between, really. Just flick them through. Thanks, Lara, for marketing. All right, Alistair, good to see you again. I love that stylish cardi. Very good. 
Uh, I think you're going to be pumped with today's topic, so what are we talking about? Well, we have uh, a visitor in today, uh, Chris Chamberlain from the Banks Peninsula in the, on the um, eastern edge of the Canterbury Plains, and uh, we're going to be talking about his uh, experience and and discussion points around leasing land and expanding your boundaries of your property uh, in the most creative ways possible for his property. So welcome, Chris. Looking forward to getting into this. So that's the aim. Right. So, um, Chris, now you uh, have, have, we've known each other for about 25 years now. Um, we met in the late 90s. And that was all on the basis that uh, you're one of these farmers that uh, reach out to find people to ask um, questions of what's going on in the property, what's working, and uh, you know how can you leverage off things. So first things first, we really should define what your farming business is. And uh, and uh, and for the listeners who may be listening for the first time, Chris comes from one of the most beautiful uh, farming environments. Uh, the Banks Peninsula is two extinct volcanoes um, on the edge of a, a large plain uh, in the South Island of New Zealand. And these two uh, uh, volcanoes have created this landscape, which is just spectacular. And uh, I think that's a good lead in for you to describe Potuki for us and how your business is structured. Thank you. Um, 1,100 hectares in Port Levy, first bay out from Middleton Harbour, about 13 k's of coastline, northerly aspect, um, sort of summer dry, winter mild, very healthy, clean stock country. So that's the core business there, and we've got a linked business, which I think we're discussing today, out on the Canterbury Plains, which was, um, which is uh, 80 hectares of irrigated, heavy, flat country. And we've got a 70 hectare lease opposite, which is a dryland block. And then we've also got access to 200 plus hectares of a adjoining cropping farmer and others in the area. So there's a bit of an elastic boundary out there. So we try and balance our breeding property, which is our core business, with the block out at least. And, and hence I use these guys' expert advice about how I make money out of their expensive <laughs> seeds. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much sums it up nicely. Oh, very good. So, look, uh, I think the idea here today is to discuss a topic associated which might relate to a lot of young people in New Zealand looking at uh, ex uh, starting in the farming world by leasing land. And I, I sort of, what I really appreciate about the questions you've always brought to us is uh, the thinking about uh, as I start to invest, as I start to uh, try to push the boundaries of what I'm doing is how best am I to leverage off this and my spending? You know, how do I interpret what I'm actually achieving? Those types of questions are, are quite uh, considerable from yourself. So I suppose I'd like to start asking you, you know, the least in block of 80 hectares is technically your leverage point for your capital stock farm at Pertiki, which is pretty heavily defined by a rainfall of about 800, 850 metres, 350 metres above sea level, down to coastal north-facing points. And by north-facing, we mean hot and dry. So anywhere under 600 mils, rainfall and drought years, that can be some of the hardest and driest places in New Zealand. So uh, it's got quite a range, but at the heart of it, it is, as you described, a capital stock farm, which is judged by live lambs at weaning, yep. and uh, and again, um, your cows and calves. You, how many cows have you got on the? Um, Two hundred and fifty beef cows, yeah. Angus Hereford, and uh, they all go to Charolais Bull. We've got an inline farming policy with a um, our Charolais breeder for the calves, so he takes the top end calves. We can't we we juggle we winter the balance. Or in a year when the calf price is good and the demand's high, which looks like this year could be, um, we will sometimes just cash them up and go. Yep. So they so just don't hold a space on your farm. They don't you hold can... a space on the farm. And uh, again, so we're back to wintering breeding cows that produce progeny to sell live weight out the gate. And uh, also on the U policy, split lemming, um, a lot of terminal sire early. And then we have the Romneys, which are a replacement A flock, and they those ewe lambs. Everything goes off the farm on the twentieth of November, which is early. 
but we target an early premium market coming out of the winter, early spring. Um, we try and then get weight back on those ewes while we've got it there before it dries out. Just to clarify, you lamb the last month of winter? We lamb the early ewes sort of if they take the ram on D-Day, they will start on the 20th of July. And that's all the point country. The, the end of the middle of winter. Basically. Yeah, in winter. And uh, and then the balance lamb sort of mid-August, which is sort of mid-winter, well, late, late winter. winter. Yeah. It's really interesting just just listening. Um, you know, we're talking about leasing land and the ability to bring uh, stock around, but you've mentioned something else which um, doesn't involve actually leasing land, but also gives a similar outcome, and that's around forming these relationships in terms of um, you know inline farming, and and that's another strategy here that you don't have to uh, lease land to add value if you're able to to share that with you know a long-standing relationship. So that comes back to that uh, that relationship. Relationship. And if you can have those those set in stone, and and and, and you've got uh, each of you winning out of that, that's another um, potential way of of running those systems without having to lease land. So maybe that's something else we've got to think about. But when when we go into thinking about land leasing, what are the other ways that we can actually um, stretch the boundaries of our farm by not either leasing or owning, but using other people in an inline system? Yeah, yeah. totally agree. And and that actually has actually what has developed with the yep. Banks Peninsula Farming too is attempting to inline farm with others. And, and uh, staying on that point, again, it's not all or nothing that you can actually do both. And actually, if you have got these uh, relationships and you are leasing and you've got a number of different options uh, in an environment that, like where you farm, where you actually don't know what next year is going to be, and they can be anything from uh, quite outstanding from a growth point of view through to um, having very little, having these uh, lots of different options in front of you to be able to exit stock off that, I think is um, you know, a good strategy of, of having lots of options and not just one. So I think that's uh, very useful in terms of if, if people are thinking about um, leasing land, whether they've actually thought about some of the other ways that they can achieve a similar a similar thing. Like the beef one's an interesting one um, with Brent. He, you know, he targets some sort of 250. He likes them to be 250 kilos and up. He knows full well if he gets them early and backgrounds them and he takes them through his fodder beat process through the winter and he hits the spring, he can have those animals being killed in December, early January, Feb. And that's that's excellent. It's a very short. So footprint. he knows his terminal genetics because yep. he's supplying it yep. to you, uh, your calving date, and what you're able to do with um, calves on cows is yep. is quite reliable at the top end of yep. of your genetic base. And so he's also guaranteeing he's getting the right class of stock yep. back into his system to make his finishing component as efficient as you can possibly get and run, he runs a pretty exceptional example of that. He does and yeah. he um, he's specific in his target so yeah. I understand why he's doing that so if he goes under that 250s and yeah. 220, 230 they're two winter cattle and the, the arithmetic and the, the carbon awesome. footprint the whole thing That's goes cool. out so it's good for me I know what he wants um, so then we can go back and try and strategize how we prevent how we present those animals at that weight range and he it's consistent. Like he has it. He's on an irrigated block. It happens every year. We're not lining up in a sale yard, which is a boom bust. Um, it takes some stress out of life too, just mm. by forming a reliable yeah. relationship. Yeah, and I think the one from from what I've seen of these systems, the one key aspect of that is communication. Yes. And so being able to indicate that you know this year is going to be a bit tough, um, and that there might be not as many reaching those targets, or that you know you've got a lot of feed and and there's going to be a few more, or they're going to be earlier or later. I think the the key thing to make those relationships work really really well is that communication, um, and when that falls down then then those systems don't work particularly well yeah absolutely and i get to you know because he's on the way to the leaston block now i get to see those animals growing out we're in contact we see the, you know he'll yeah. let me know the kill sheets you know where they're falling um they weigh them continually so i get i get feedback he's yeah. he's the stud stock breeder so he also gets to yeah. see the progeny so it's a, it's yeah inline farming especially banks peninsula because we do one thing well was we breed animals and uh, we need someone to finish them well and taking the risk factor out of having a market one year and not uh, not others because of climate or trends is our Achilles heel and that's why we're where we are at Leeston and uh, 
that's that was a foil for us to take a risk profile out. It is an increased workload. Um, it is a different set of skills. Um, and we're on a smaller scale. Um, some of the bigger operators in New Zealand operate on big finishing blocks Absolutely. on the Canterbury Plains and they grow them in an area. Absolutely. Now, speaking of uh, workload and scale, uh, the Leaston blocks 80 hectares of um, in the heart of a, a significant um, arable environment, a lot of uh, small seed crops of all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, you originally had an irrigation system based on a side roller, a side roll system. Uh, you Poor man's pivot. <laughs> yeah, poor man's pivot. And because of that, and you living, uh, closing in on 50 minutes? Yeah, it's about an hour. Uh, about an hour. Yeah. Um, from Leaston, that, that became a limitation to reliability. So you've invested in a, a pivot irrigator on the small block. Uh, take us through when you're thinking about the financials of doing that. You know what what was needed, what needed to change because this is the point. You can't carry on doing the same thing when you create an efficient system or whatever. You must change things. So what what were the thought processes of you went through when you started to look at investing and putting a pivot on your land? Well, our old one, the poor man's pivot, was it was wasn't too bad as labour intensivity when it was sitting in the paddock. But when you were moving a paddock to paddock, it was like a good workout at the gym. And my father was getting older because he was my main man out there at that stage. And then we've inherited another guy. He was he's equally my father's age now, but um, it didn't turn him on that much. So working backwards, it was the it was in, we were in the process in Canterbury about water consents, and uh, we've got a you know we were pumping sort of wells on artesian diesel surface pumps at sort of eight, nine, ten meters, and the water process for consenting was tricky. So it was obvious we had to change to be we were still consentable, but we needed you know there was there was we needed to put the well down deeper, um, of which we did. So then we so we needed to capitalize it. So then we went into what's best, and we looked at various strategies with Briggs guns runs and all sorts and fell on the pivot that runs a big arc. So then we got the costings in front of us and then you go, okay, how do you make that work? Yeah. And, and then you've got 10 foot ditches yeah, running ditches, through your property, and got got culverts. And, and uh, so we were a very early adapter of fencing creeks and ditches off because if animals go into creeks and ditches, yeah. you've generally got a very grumpy person trying to pull them out or they drown. So, uh, we had done all that before regulations were hit because we had animals on there. Um, the the pivot story, running a straight profit margin on an animal born born in um, Putiki at Port Levy in late November, early December, and taking it to Leeston to finish it is a traditional summer schedule falls when supply comes uh, on. The market goes down when there's plenty around, they don't pay a lot. So the margins on doing that could some years be as low as sort of $10. Mm. And that included a cartage there, a cartage out, crutching, feeding, let alone all the, the crops you've Animal put on. So, yeah. so it, it, it doesn't pay. And it was the worst part about it. It was just so damned unpredictable and you couldn't bank on it. So one, some years when it was short, you'd make good margins and everyone wants to do it. The rest of the time you're doing, you're saying, why didn't I let that animal go store and go and float around in the ocean and, and have a bit of downtime? So just by having animals on least, and we couldn't, I couldn't see how we would make that work. It was a nice to have and easier operational. So that's when we sat down with yourself, Alistair, and, and Juddy's been involved over the time and um, sat down and said, look, if I'm going to spend this, show me how I'm going to make this platform of land, 80 hectares, how am I going to make it pay? Because it's got to be more than just a value add on a lamb. And, you know, we had some good advice from Tim Ridgen, who showed me around the district of guys that were doing vegetables, cut and carry, uh, wheat crops. I didn't want to go into that. I don't own, I own a tractor now, begrudgingly, <laughs> but um, I don't want to own gear. And uh, we're surrounded by very good contractors. We're lucky we don't have to. So. Yeah. We can just make a phone call and, and manage. Um, so, so we did that, and and we fell on quite a few things, um, of which land finishing is still a priority. It's in there, yeah. but it's sort of eight months there. But we need to shoulder and make more money. So we sort of threw a two thousand a hectare down. So we've got to be making that at least. So that's two thousand dollars a hectare, and your typical at the time of that discussion, your typical 
um, breeding operation would be lucky to be at a thousand, mm. at, very much at that stage. Yeah, and if you just did it on a margin trade, we valued it on. But yeah. if you were only getting a ten, fifteen dollar margin, it just wasn't paying for that one. Yeah. And then you had to then keep stocking it because you'd in buying and selling so you're at a risk. So that's when we bought in um, Wattie's peas, which suits our rotation out there with uh, what we're doing. As a, as a change crop, we spray that out in early December and it gets drilled. We just have to put water on it. They manage the spray. They harvest it. And we're back in there with a, you know, a grass or a follow-up crop in the first of February. So it's only out for that length of time and it sets that crop up well. We've actually got that crop design so it goes in on a clean pasture and you know, hopefully we've got a weed-free pasture when we start again. We did that, beans, beans fell out. What is beans, green beans, but the timing of it's not great because they're coming off now or a bit later, which now we're in the autumn. Um, and we can get wet, when we get wet we slow down, so when we redrill we've got a, a, a paddock that's not performing yet, a leg. And we tried maize, which seemed like a hell of a good idea and hit the wettest winter and we had to have a track machine to get it off. So and that was too late coming off. And and really when I look at your class of country and and it's hard for, you know, when we talk about uh, different landscapes, obviously the soil types create um, a lot of the leverage to what your businesses are capable of doing. And this property's got quite a heavy uh, clay base. Uh, and it's got a high water table, so the whole property can get heavy um, quite quickly. And uh, for example, the damage done by that maize harvesting operation was really significant because the clay also dries out and gets extremely hard and can take a long time to create a, a structure again. And that's caused us a few problems. Yeah, what, what strikes me uh, when we're talking about these lease blocks, the first thing probably is that you've got a really good understanding of your home block and the relative strengths and weaknesses there. And so when you're looking at um, a lease block, um, you've actually got a job in mind. And so I think that's the that's the first thing. And some of the other things that you might need to do on that to make um, the lease block and, and any infrastructure you've got to put on that pay. I think the other, um, the other uh, really important part about this is actually understanding potentially what the lease block is like. Um, because uh, if, you, if you think about, um, you know, it could be useful because it's next door, but um, its um, natural characteristics may not be in line with what you're thinking. So I think the, that's the two bits. And you mentioned that you've, you, you know, you've, you've walked around that property and, and, and understood the, its natural capital um, and what potentially it, it could bring. But I think the other two, two really important things, understanding your own business um, and, and where that's going to um, add value, but also whether you are actually using or the lease block you're looking at, it might be next door. But is it the has it got the natural capital that you require for the plans that you've got? You know that, that was very much the case. Um, luckily, we had been grazing it. Um, it was run. It was a, a block that you wouldn't say is being farmed. Yeah, farmed. yeah. So just to find that. So what we've been talking about with yeah. the pivot is is your property, yeah. um, but this is this is elastic boundary of a, a farmer with a, a quite a entrepreneurial look to the surrounding areas. So the Everywhere around this property is arable without livestock. So um, they've all got primary infrastructure mostly, as in there's, there's stock proof fences. That it to, has, a point. to a point. Uh, they haven't but degraded an, with. Ar- the good thing about an arable farmer is if the fences aren't good and my animals get in, you get a call really quickly. <laughs> yeah, they tell you what's not going right. Uh, but also because it's also on, on uh, the edge of a small agricultural township, uh, there's also a bit of land around the edge of the township that is actually what you describe as, I wouldn't say land banked, but uh, you would say it, it's got real estate value, which basically means that sometimes it can be sitting moderately mm. idle. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just being present gives you those opportunities and also that you haven't got a high competition specifically around you necessarily for your stock class. I would think we've leased a few properties in our time and um, generally speaking on the peninsula, the one you get to lease, I'd say 80% of the time, is the most rundown property in a valley and you're dealing with someone that thinks it's the best property in the valley and they've never put any fur on, but you have to and you have to fence it and fix it. and uh, It's just generally the way it's been. And uh, 
This particular property was like that. It was a white post property, and um, the infrastructure, it was a little bit run down, but it's it's a good farm, and it's been a good farm, and it had a good history in, in, in the past. And so we were lucky to get an opportunity. We knew that the neighbours were good. They're good people, and um, they're, they're elderly, so they don't want hassle. We'd been grazing it, and we'd said, shall we lease, because we didn't have any control about changing pasture swards, and it was pretty native what we inherited. And so that relationship is totally important, and it is a relationship handshake. We've got a legal lease agreement, but, you know, the nature of these people is you word you bond. Yeah. Um, so being dryland, it was actually an advantage to us because our winter heavy block, I think that's what you're leading to, our home block, we knew what it's capable of. This block, this block, we I sat there in my head and worked out what could I do, what would it run on a per annum base if, as, as a breeding ewe. So it's 70 odd hectares and, you know, you just can't make it stack money-wise. So I said, right, well, how do we make it grow a lot of grass or a lot of forage, but how do we also make it grow like on our home bloke, on our home, on our home block? percentage out some forages that actually will run us through the shoulders on a dryland and so I want I want my cake and eat it so I want December January February to operate as well and I sat down did some figures so I knew in my own mind what I was going to do and then I, I rang you two likely characters and said here we go um, I'm coming to come in here get your whiteboard out and all I really did was just prompt one or two sentences and then Alistair and Juddy would go, well, I don't agree with that, Juddy. <laughs> well, I don't agree with that, Alistair. But we had a really, really strong session yeah. on what that property would grow as a blank sheet if you did it right, put the fert on. And I'd already come to my mind the conclusion that I couldn't afford just to walk in there and drip feed two paddocks a year um, to get it to go. I said, well, tell me if I'm wrong, but I really, my gut's telling me I've got to go in here guns blazing and change this thing around so it's it's get the fertilizer on get the crops and forages in so i'm actually the come come spring i've actually got something i can deal with that puts weight on animals i think that, that's where we got to and then. i think the first challenge for me too though was to ask the question um is the property paying for itself on its footprint or is it actually helping you change something somewhere else to actually make you money somewhere else? So does it have to be completely self-funding on its actual footprint, or can it free up and help you actually change your economic basis of another part of your farming system? And I think those were the first challenges of working out how you're gearing it. Are you gearing it to be self-sufficient, it's got to pay for itself full stop, or maybe it doesn't have to pay for itself and the stock flow on the property, but it frees up for you to physically change a stock policy somewhere else mm -hmm. that is changing your economics. Yeah. And, I, and that's the only way I could see it, is that if you didn't change anything, how are you going to get more? Mm. And so you had to change something. And so and what, did, what really did it allow you to do, uh, bringing in a block like that? It, it really it, it allowed us to use our main property, the 80 hectare with the good grasses it, it allowed us to say okay we we don't need to be wintering on that we can walk that through i had been utilizing the cropping farmer down the road for that to a point but it was sort of in our you didn't have control of it whereas this one did and so i could actually have that spring burst we could actually lamb use on the dryland block so just to give a context so the key to the original 80 hectares that you, you your own is that it is quite heavy as we described yep, the, the beauty of the irrigation is it we've always found that the property with its um, wet soil interestingly enough is always a, it's only about the 620 630 mil rainfall yep. um, interestingly enough it's actually a really difficult spring establishment environment it can be spring established because of the soil but you go from wet to dry and hard soil conditions really fast and so water helped us become more reliable and and getting crops up and going but Again, I think the biggest description of this wet winter management, the soil destocking this land in winter and what it gives you in the spring, was the year that you made a call to find grazing off your primary 80 hectares and destock it because it was so wet. 
But because you freed up the land, you didn't put pressure on it, you didn't have stock through it all winter under wet conditions, you made the most momentous amount of silage mm. in the following spring, of which you sold mm. at a rate that, unless I'm mistaken, covered your grazing, covered your replacement fertiliser, and you actually walked away ahead. Yep. No. And that was by taking all your animals off your own land mm. and putting them somewhere else. Correct, and that was an extreme, like the driveway was running water, yeah. and uh, it, it was quite late. It was sort of mid to late August, and we had the opportunity to get off because it, even with lambs on that country, can turn it quickly. And, yeah, that did work, and then we managed to get the fur truck on, and then we managed to be first in the queue for, you know, like good Italian silage with some clovers in it. So it was top-end stuff and went onto milking platform. and. It did two jobs. We got that surplus off. It paid for the grazing plus, and it paid for the fertilizer. So it had done its job plus added something in the pocket, but it set us up to fly for the rest of spring and early summer. summer. Yeah. So that, that sort of dawned on me as a policy. And then we've locked in that deal with the milking platform, which for the area we farm, when the cows, you guys have to tell me out here, when they, when they start to milk, you know, it's, it's imperative they get them up to peak milk, and they will quite often feed. This stuff was cut and carried and fed. It's okay. fed directly on that first So shift. not in silage, it's literally cut green onto the onto the dairy platform yeah. next door, mostly in late August and September, as soon as you can get vehicles. Because uh, right. normally that first week of October. Oh, okay, so it is, yeah, it's it, it is shut just up, almost pre-mating. Shut up August, first yeah. of August, and it comes off. And it's, yeah. um, so that's uh, middle t uh, early to middle of spring. Mm. So this, this year... This year we we got rid of thirty seven hectares out of the eighty, and uh, you know it it was a it was a good cash flow for the business. So and it it had done it. Yeah. Then we fertilised it. Then we set it up for what's coming over from. See, this what I love is that you, you're a stock farm, but you've got your eyes wide open to the fact that sometimes it's actually if you can make it work, it's actually better to take some stock off your land yeah. and free it up. And allow it to thrive, and then actually, it can go. It can go. You can get silage off it, as an example, which mm. is not live weight or meat. Which, mm. you, as a stock farmer, that's what you're up to. Um, but the state that the silage uh, silaging process allows that pasture to be presented in when the animals mm. come back is right on the mark for what you're trying to achieve. And again, coming back off that property um, into your lease. Uh, your, your description is you focus on getting a lot done early, investing quite a few dollars early because you're um, trying to get as much of that, and that's a 45, 40, 50 hectare block, wasn't it? 70. 70 hectare block. So mm -hmm. you've only got three years in that lease in the yeah. first phase. Uh, you've got to get as much done early as possible, yeah. um, and you've got to get it in a a system that doesn't just commit you to future cost the whole way through that process. Yeah, one of the things that really um, interests me here, and that's around, um, you know, there are a, a number of different options, it appears, that you've got in front of you when you're making some of the, these decisions. And, and um, I'd really like to unpack, you know, how do you decide, how do you get those, how do you get those, all of those options in front of you? You know, you know, um, you you could be forgiven for going. Um, I'm a I'm a lamb trader, and I could put some other stock in here. But but here you've talked about um, you know creating silage for a for a dairy platform. Um, you've got um, you know you've 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 gone to see your next door neighbour cropping farm, and and so it looks like um, you have endless opportunities. How do you how do you um, how do you come to those? How do you you know is it is it people that you're talking to? Um, do you lie lie awake at night thinking about these things? It, it's and and I think because because what I can see it it is actually sets you up to be able to make a, a great decision because you've got so many options. So how do you how do you get those options? It is it is about being there and being aware and and listening and 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 with people and and for the for the neighbouring for the neighbouring um, farmer the cropping farmer like he he knows full well that his workload when he's lambing ewes down that we that we graze off. When he's lambing ewes, were the key times he needed to be establishing his, his arable crops. So the whole block went arable. He didn't want to leave it in fallow from the autumn, so he wanted animals. We're there. We pay him a per head per week. Um, he puts the grass in and, and he walks away. We manage it for him. If he wants stuff, we'll, we're there. We'll drop of a hat. We'll take stuff. We'll chew. So 
it works for him. His synergy is he much prefer he doesn't cut any 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 of his straw. Nothing comes off that farm because he's saying it's fertility off the farm. Yeah, so he loves it. Those sheep go around and eat his weeds and his hedgerows, and then they the dung and the the dung and the pea go back in. So yeah. he's he's got a really good view of that. It works for him. But as you say, Juddy, it's about talking every year. What's going forward? What do we got? Time frames, and then I have to juggle that to be at the point of not being overstocked, but sometimes we are because that's just around the corner. And then that fills in for our lease block or our home block. Okay, when do I need, I know I'm going to have to plug some holes. So I have to, ha- I have to be able to dial up to grow something. And, and one decision we've just made on the home block is a, an asset paddock that's coming to the end or gone to Wattie's Peas this year. It's got barley grass through it and it was just looking perfect to spray and we took a call to spray it because we knew even taking a baleage crop, which is where it's destined, won't be great. So we've just stuck an annual in this year, and we did the maths on it um, through Robert. And uh, again, you're asking the right people, and we said, well, for the expense of direct drilling this in and growing a, a true Italian and then taking it out in the spring, is we're going to get that crop, but I'm also going to fill that hole for trying to have those animals yeah. When and and, and you've created a weed control option yeah. too, because yeah. barley grass yeah, yeah, wheat, them wheat as well. But yeah. we can we get we have a problem when we hit. It's not a bad problem because I'm farming on a dryland hill block, and the problem is always finding feed. The problem sort of coming into September, October when we start to move is the grubbing guys going, "I need these here," and I'm going, "I need these home," <laughs> and. Uh, it's it's the space of three four weeks can juggle and the phone going going hey Chris you're the only fool around the district that's got some news you wouldn't want to whip down and feed the grass the grass seed paddocks off we're sitting in an arable area yeah. where management for them's their crop yeah. and animals look there is massive synergies Juddy you've mentioned it before that are there and um, God we just got to get ourselves organised so that we can help one another out um, so so a lease block being if you talked about that lease block just being one block if I went and leased it and didn't have the offshoots, I would have gone looking for those and saying, hey, you know, if I want to have enough ewes parked up here at the end of July to lamb, um, I can't carry these through the winter. You know, I need them to be around, hopefully in droving distance where they're on the road. It seems to me, and and if I'm kind of um, distilling this down to some really simple messages, the first message is you seem to be very good at spotting opportunities. Right, so um, being able to understand what the arable guy wants, or what the dairy farmer wants, and and what his issues are, and how you could be part of the solution. So I think yeah. that's the one thing is being very good at um, at understanding what other people are after and, and opportunities for you. I think the other really critical bit then is the the critical evaluation of that. You can be part of um, you know a a, a cropping farmer's um, set up for his ryegrass crop and that's the opportunity but you're also very good at then making sure that it, it's a dollar for you and so I think the other two if you bring those two together spotting opportunity and then making sure those opportunity are actually financially viable I think the are the two things that that are that I think are, are probably the key to the success and and I don't know um do you do a lot of spreadsheet work have you do you um do you engage other people to to run those numbers but it seems that in the back of your head, Right, the the simple maths that you've got is that um that there's there's, there's got to be a do, there's got to be a dollar in this, or there's got to be maybe a not purpose. maybe a purpose, and, and you've talked about um you know weed control and and looking at the whole picture. So um take us through is, is obviously that's you don't do that by um that doesn't happen by chance. What's what what's how, what's how do you do that? What what's your process? Yeah, I do. Jackie would say I'm st- strategic thinker, but I'm not a I'm not a big on a spreadsheet. I do do a lot of gross margins on paper and kick it and biff it and throw it. And I do make sure, like my cropping guy, we talk. Like he's telling me what he's putting in the ground. He's saying, "What have you got coming forward?" I say, "You tell me what you need," and then try and structure it that way. So we can pull anything at any time from Putiki, like light use at scanning, twinning light use. I mean, they can come there. They can come there for two months and then they can go back. Um, so I do look at that and I do, I work towards that spring period, which is the money months for a breeding system, as you guys know. And if I've got my red clovers going, you know, I've got to eat them. So a lambing ewe, lactating a lamb that's a sale ewe, is an outstanding stock class unit. It, it, 
it betters the late winter lamb finishing lamb, which is going to cut teeth, and they're going to say they've got to go. They've got to go now. This is they've reached the limit, and then all of a sudden you've got the feed exploding. So I work backwards on that. I work backwards on what I need to be the two blocks. The baleage goes off, so so they're right through there to August, and then the baleage goes off a fair chunk of that. We sit off the red clover, so we've got it sitting quite strong before we put the ewes on, and when it goes, my God, you need it to go. Yeah. But we're not scared. I'm not so scared now in, in, in actually taking a light animal from Putiki that's struggling for whatever reason, if she had twins or triplets last year, to get her on a truck, to have them itemised at Port Levy. So they're lambing around the yard paddocks that are close to me getting them out so a ewe and lamb at foot can go out. Um, so I think it's a real benefit to have that breeding block over there to feed into that. But the dollars and cents, um, you know, the silage is one. That that ewe lamb trade is another. We hit that in mid-November and... Thank you very much for coming, Mum. She's a lovely big fat you. When I look at them and go, my God, you should well, be back home. Yeah, why aren't you doing her again? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but, but she's she look, it, it does it, and then then it starts to open, and the lambs come and through, just, the ewe lambs come through. And just to define that, make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. There is a, a last lambing you. That's the and often you tend to find the cull for age, the cull for teeth, and. Um, and so the reality is they tend to be low body condition animals after they've uh, often um, raised, let's just say, two lambs. And uh, there's nearly always been a margin in a heavy ewe versus a light ewe. And so what you're doing is growing two lambs out magnificently on a proven ewe, and then you're actually feeding her in a way in these, these locations where there's always a live weight advantage on that ewe at weaning. Yep. And, uh, and that's a, a, a very much a... Um, a leverage point for getting more out of the system than just yep. popping two lambs. And she's she's actually she's an asset. She's a she, she's another half a lamb. She's a you I'm taking yeah. on that I wouldn't be yeah. on the hill. We can get another year out of her, um, but I need to be kinder to her through the winter. And yeah. secondly, we're targeting a November market when the season starts. Yeah. Stock a short supply, so you can get ewes killed. Go through this year. Go through another three four weeks, and it was very hard. And so again, coming back to I think the distilling down some of these key messages, you know, we've said earlier the key thing is to actually understand your business and where um, you know the dollars and cents are, are coming from and, and what gives you um, you know good margin and what not so good. Um, and then the the other one that I was hearing was um, particularly around the the lease block and and your neighbours is communication again. You know, being able to um, forward plan. You know, what have you got coming, um, and then reflect that you know uh, on your home block that things might be a little slow and they might be coming forward a bit faster. So having that real um, the real conversation with um, probably a lot of people, um, con contractors. I mean, you must spend a lot of time on the phone, Chris. Yeah, I do. Like um, one of the guys that was working with me, he was. We came back one spring, Alistair met him, and um, Alistair had been in the car for the afternoon. We had all sorts going on, and um, Morris said he's driving home. He says, "I've got a man. Have I got a headache?" And I said, "Oh, you're not feeling very well." He said. No, he said, I've just my head spinning because, and, and it was, I did, I just took, and then I thought about it. And he, he said, I talked to him afterwards, and he said, Why don't you just get rid of all that and just let's go mustering and get the sheep in and just sell everything, store and have an easy life? <laughs> there is merit in that. <laughs> yeah. um, and as you've got to pull back on all these things, if you're doing all that extra work without making any money, yeah, um, that's all you are doing. And I can't got well. to emphasize that's your key point on most occasions now is everything's for a purpose everything has to be part of a plan whether it's the plan directly in front of you or leveraging something mm. else so i think you know when i look at it too that is exactly it and, you know come back to your lease block and and looking at how much you invest in your first year on a lease block i mm. i look at that and i think well you know what you've identified straight away is what is the purpose of having this land to make a difference if you don't change it fast and then what we're sort of at and we're, this is where we're actually at is that how does your attitude to spending attitude to investment change through the life of that lease so we're now at, coming to the end of that example, mm. and uh, we've had these discussions just inside the last three or four months about how mm. are we finishing, how, yeah. how's the investment phase finishing, because uh, really this is the time that you could exit a lease 
and some really uh, cheap, fast feed options, yeah. um, not leaving anything significant in the ground with any high value because actually that could be wasted value for you. Mm. Um, it's an interesting process, though, the way we've looked at that. Well, to go back before we come to that, mm. so when we inherited this property, that took the lease on when I had the whiteboard session with you guys, and because of what we'd been doing over the road on our own, I knew I knew the advantage of those high growth rate grasses that, and the legumes, and, and it's, which I've had from years from you guys. And I'm going, can I replicate them on this dryland block? And you guys says, yes, you can. So, so <laughs> that's a lot of expense, and there's no irrigation to back up if you have a disaster. So, the first thing again is ring your people. I got ravens down our rep for fertilizer, so I said I want to soil test every paddock on this farm. It's a lease block. When were they last tested? I said I don't know. It's a lease block rundown. But I want you to help me here. I'm not paying for a soil test on every damn paddock on this farm. But and they, I said, look, you guys are going to get it back. So we had to address paddocks for capital to get it in and um, to get the crop in to get it to grow because otherwise we couldn't tick that box. That was tick box one. Tick box two was how good was the land? You know, a contractor saying, oh, it's not good enough to put this in. And I said, well, we'll have first year in. We want to try. So we tried one. We had one rep that said, you can't do this. And I said, well, we're going to because we need to see if the red clover was going to work on this really rough paddock. It did work. So it gave us confidence to then in the spring hit it, hit some more. So we so we got a sort of a mini system, dryland system. And when it rained last year, the year before, man, we had as we were our lamb growth rates were as good coming off that block as they were off the irrigator block. So we knew it could adjust. This year it's been really dry and it, it hasn't been to that extent. But but going out now, like there's a two years to run on the lease, and I'm looking and I'm get Alistair out and had a look and said, look, two years to run, what do I do here? And if we if we have it all grassed up, which just sounds really simple, which I think would be your go-to, just, just biff your grass in. Come the spring, massive amount of grass, dryland, drying off. I'm sitting there, I said, Alistair, I want it to grow. I want my winter capacity and I want my spring capacity. We know it's autumn, winter, spring, but, but I don't want to give up the summer. I want some summer. And we had three legume paddocks that had, were run out. We've got one there and he came, Alistair came back and said, go for legume. I said, okay, how do I make that? So we are investing in that, but potentially looking forward in the spring, we will have sort of four paddocks in a legume and we can run that legume for two years which will give me that I've got my finger in that pie. And really we're trying to say this is the last time the tractor will be coming into these paddocks with exit looming. If we get another renewal, we can change, but but the guys that we're leasing off are, are elderly and you know they don't want to be tied down to something long-term. I can fully see their position. So I have to be flexible, and I think we are. And 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 so that's why I went to you and said, how do we get out of this? So. Well, we made the discussion also is that you want you put yourself in a chance to win and uh, and chance to be close to 100% of what you want to do off the block right through to the very end. Mm. And so that becomes this issue that you know for a fact you're just not going to be able to leverage anything off grass only on 80 hectares uh, if it was all just grass only for the last 18 months. And that's, that's big windows of time where you're not leveraging anything like you were in the first two or three years. So we've put ourselves in a position where you can actually still leverage at 100% for the whole length of the lease uh, with actually some still some pretty cost-effective exit strategies at the end. Yeah. So um, that has been the primary process we've gone through there. So what, look, I think- What can um, go wrong with that, Juddy? Yeah, what can go wrong with that, Juddy? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I guess I think the um, what I was starting to think about is is in your exit strategy. Um, have you thought about um, if you do have to exit that the the um, the flow and effect that's got to other parts of your business, and maybe starting to think about you know that you are going to have you've now got not got this block and what um, all of the things that you've taken for granted that this block gives you, and you've now not got. So have you started thinking about that ahead of time? That's what I. That's what I do with my downtime. I think about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're correct. I do, and uh, yeah. If it if it disappears, well, the stock classes and stock numbers pull back. Um, I would be more reliant on the cropping guy next door. But that's mainly growing hoggets out in the, in lamb hoggets in the winter. Um, yeah, it will. It, it'll be a juggle and, a, and more probably lamb sold on farm. 
we have to, it's sort of like shrinking your business to make it work, getting back to those adjustments. I mean, it's worked really well having this block totally adjacent. It, it has worked well for us. And when we, like as Alistair said, like the 80 hectares in the home block, there's 30 hectares of that is in red clover. We try and sit around that 25 to 30 hectares. This block will have, out of the 70 hectares, we're probably you know, going to have 20, 20, Five hectares. So, so we're talking about a business running about forty percent legume mm, based um, mm, finishing stands. Yeah, and the rest of the grasses are sort of two, you know, two three year um, Italian. So when they grow with and give them a bit of fertilizer, I mean, this block was so dry. This year was the driest summer I think we've had, and um, it's absolutely bounced back. That wonderful grass mohawker. I don't know who grows that. <laughs> <laughs> probably exactly. um, last comment from me, and then I'll get Alistair to sum up, but. Um, the other thing I was thinking about here is, um, you know, your system is something that um, you're starting to get towards an optimization of. Um, it's actually quite complex when you think about the number of different um, aspects to it, the number of different blocks, the number of different things you're doing with it. And I guess um, for those people starting out, um, you'd go... Um, you probably recognize here that there's a huge amount of um, management skill here that if um, for some people it will be um, taking the very basic options, um, the straightforward options, the ones um, that give you um, out, you know, outcomes most of the time. But as you step through something that becomes more reliable, gives you more options, you actually need to add more um, management time to that. And so I think that's a really good take home message that the more sophisticated these systems get the the you're probably getting far more consistent results out of this um you know the the productivity is very high but increasingly more and more you've got management time you've got to be very good at looking at those opportunities um taking the right opportunities and so you you you're, the the management game has to lift so much more and so um taking some of these things on you've got to be prepared for that increase in terms of management and, and I would say you're probably one of the few people um, that could um, successfully, over a long period of time, manage the the um, the the complexities of of this. And you know, it doesn't help with t um, two fellas coming in with hair-brained ideas about what what could be next. So I think that's a really key uh, when we when we're talking about this in terms of mm -hmm. um, you know offering advice to others. Got to say that 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 level of management around that and and, and picking the picking the right yep. winners comes a whole lot harder as as the systems get more and more complex. Agreed. And uh, that that um like the as you said, you know, you must be making a lot of phone calls and you go home, yeah. I've got a good contractor, ring him. He we've been working a long time together. So he's really good. Robert Trot, PG Wrights and for the seed through you guys. He's he's excellent. He understands our system. So he's looking at the crop. I can't be looking at it. I'm over in Port Levy, but when I come out, I'll ring him and say, hey, and then he'll have a look around. He'll tell me. So you have to use those people and that expertise. Um, Tom, who's living at Putiki, Tom and Nomi, they've got a lease block, which, you know, I introduced them to Alistair. I said, you don't have to know everything, Tom, but you can ask and you can listen and you can learn. So he's around the corner, phone went, opportunity for a lease block around here in Tightap, and um, would Tom be interested? And I said, yes, he would. He's 30 and he's trying to get his feet in the ground and he's he's doing a hell of a good job around there. And it, it's that property's pretty run down. It's a challenging property, but he's getting his head around it and he's doing everything for the first time. And I said, it doesn't always work, so be prepared. Just do your homework. He's relying on Robert. He's had an input from Alistair. So what I'd say to that young person leasing, it is your chance to get your foot on the board and take take the most rundown property you can at a price point um, and then work out where you sign it, work out how you're going to make some money. And you don't have to own stock. You can graze stock. You can graze cattle. You can, um, you can own some stock. Walk your way in. All your bank wants to know is that you pay back some money and they will lend to you again. Um, so he's really, and, and our industry's old sheep and beef, 58 I think is the average age, and we need young people. There's got to be a transition stage coming up, I feel, with where does it go? The capital base is held up here, at expensive land, and how do young people, enthusiasm, brains get in? And uh, there's got to be some way, of, and I think leasing's probably a way that they can get their foot on the door. Um, and old hardheads can sort of help assist. 
Yeah. And, and, I, and, and I think that's really um, a really great place to actually try to conclude because when I look at it, I think that's where mentorship comes in and people with experience of thinking in the space uh, to just actually navigate the questions of just not doing something for the sake of doing it. You have to still have a thought process around what you're trying to package up. And I feel um, if I was to summarise uh, what I perceive are some of the strengths you've done over time is you've always recognised that uh, the importance of relationship, opportunity, you're not so proud that everything has to be done by you or in your system. Uh, you don't have to be completely en enclosed. You can actually leverage, you, you might be a stock farmer, but you can actually um, take your stock off your land and make money off something else for a period of time and for a win in both situations. So I feel... Uh, the concept with lease blocks is to identify the full opportunity that comes with them, uh, identify uh, the fact that you have to make changes and quite strategically um, aggressive at the start of a leasing process. Uh, you've got to work out how that leverages off all your uh, existing assets and what you can achieve through your existing relationships. And the key really still is that if you don't change enough, you won't actually get an economic return off these things. And so the moment you change your land footprint, you bring in outside land, you must change enough to make it all pay. Mm. And it doesn't have to pay for itself, but it can make other things work better at a much higher level if you can change them enough. Mm. So I feel all those are the sort of questions you need to be asking. Also, the process of investing in fertilizer and the cropping systems or, or pastoral systems that are going to fit your stock expectations and flow not everyone's finishing lambs in summer so others might not have a problem with grass-based summering but the reality is not always can grass-based summering finish lambs and you need to really invest at the start of that process and i think the uh, the big message would be to focus on uh the way you start to finish a lease block because it's your performance over the whole every single year of the lease and if you um, whittle away your initial um, investments for the last period of time, you actually give up some of the profit over the whole period of that lease. So you're looking at the profitability of the three years of the lease, not just the first two. And so how you finish is quite a big deal uh, in a lease-based system as well. And reputation-wise, you, you're not going to walk off a lease and leave it a mess. I mean, yeah. that's what gives leasing a bad name. You know, you, you're looking after a family asset for the the owners of that property so and that sort of attitude is exactly the, the mental approach you should be trying to run it at 100 percent. you should be efficient with the way you finish uh but you also like i say you, you want to put yourself in a chance for that lease to be extended mm. or actually uh someone who's going to see that you've been a really good operator and is prepared to lease their land to you at a later date so I, Judy, I think that pretty much sums up some of the strengths of Chris's system and, and some of the thinking that he's put into it, which we've both appreciated being part of. Excellent. Well, I see I've missed a call from the spray contractor and that's never good. So um, we might call it a close and uh, we'll see you next time. See you next time, Judy. Thank you.